So hello everyone. Uh, so today we are going to talk about the uh, post translational modifications in uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, so one of the most common modifications is uh, protein glycosylation. Um, so what happens, uh, protein glycosylation can take place uh, in both the two conditions we have previously discussed. It can take place uh, during the co-translational translocation of the proteins and it can also be done um, once the proteins have been synthesized. Um, that means in, in, in post-translational modifications. So both co-translational uh, modifications and post-translational modifications can take place in the proteins in the ER. Uh, so during co-translational tr translocation, when a protein is being translocated into the protein through the translophon, so as soon as the polypeptide chain grows into the lumen of the ER, uh, the associated enzyme, which is known as oligosaccharyl transferase, it, uh, it transfers an, an oligosaccharide molecule from the uh, from the neighboring dolicol molecule onto the poly growing polypeptide chain. So you have this polypeptide chain growing into the lumen of the ER. Next to this protein, you have got this enzyme known as oligosaccharyl transferase. And next to this enzyme, you have a dolicol uh, molecule. Dolicols are um, generally long chain, mostly unsaturated. Uh, organic compounds and uh, and associated with phosphate molecules so they're also known as dolicol phosphate so this molecule basically functions as an anchor for the formation of oligosac uh, oligosaccharide molecules so that means that these uh, monosaccharides they uh, attached uh, onto these dolicol molecules so uh, more than one constituting oligosaccharide molecules um, and once these oligosaccharide molecule this bunch of molecule is uh, molecules is attached to this dolicol molecule this becomes this oligosaccharide now becomes available for uh, protein glycosylation so this remains anchored onto the dolicol molecule so dolicol molecule is an an anchor for the oligosaccharide molecules and this enzyme, uh, which is known as oligosaccharyl transferase, this transfers this oligosaccharide molecule from the dolicol onto the growing polypeptide chain. And this dolicol molecule then becomes available for the uh, attachment of another oligosaccharide molecule. Uh, this enzyme, oligosaccharyl transferase, uh, basically it transfers these oligosaccharide molecules onto the polypeptide chain only if these oligosaccharide molecules are associated with dolicol. Um, so after these are transferred onto this uh, growing polypeptide chain, uh, this enzyme uh, looks for another aspartame molecule. So basically, this modification, this glycosylation, takes place on the aspartame amino acids in the growing. Uh, in the growing polypeptide chain. So if there are five aspartame molecules, uh, there are certain conditions, we would talk about them later, but if uh, this uh, growing polypeptide chain contains another aspartame somewhere here, when this is uh, this portion of the protein, uh, the, this, this amino acid is translocated into the ER lumen, this would be uh, the, the uh, the oligosaccharide would be associated with the next aspartame molecule and so on. So these dolicols, um, they also function in, in, in post-translational uh, modifications. Um, and in that case, multiple oligosaccharide molecules would be attached onto this dolicol molecule. So there would be, a, would be a bunch of molecules here, another bunch here, and, and, and so on. So this would be more like a tree. Lots of... Uh, Lots of carbohydrate molecules associated with this dolicol molecule, so that would be a excuse me, so that would be a bigger uh, molecule here. And uh, why do we have this 
uh, these these bigger molecules, um, oligosaccharide molecules attached to the dolichol, uh, they're generally utilized for uh, for um, for post-translational modifications, especially in case of uh, large glycoproteins in the ER. So glycoproteins, as we know, are heavily glycosylated. So um, we need to put uh, or we need to add uh, a larger number of oligosaccharide molecules on these proteins. So this oligosaccharide transferase remains embedded into the membrane next to the translocon the same way like uh, we have previously discussed, like we have signal peptidase here. The same way like signal peptidase uh, stays next to the translocon, um, you would also find uh, the oligosaccharide transferase. So the job of signal peptidase would be to cleave the signal sequence and the job of uh, oligosaccharide transferase would be to transfer the um, oligosaccharide molecules which are associated with the dolichol here. Uh, oligosaccharide is going to transfer these molecules onto this uh, growing polypeptide chain. Um, so other monosaccharides can also get uh, attached to the forming oligosaccharide carrier here. So if this is the initial molecule that was attached to the dolichol molecule, uh, some other oligosaccharide molecules can or monosaccharides can also be attached onto this uh, onto this initial oligosaccharide uh, carrier. So when th when when these uh, uh, these these uh, carburetted molecules are associated with the polypeptide chain, they're not attached to any aspergine molecule. So there are certain conditions and the conditions are that this aspergine molecule should either be followed by a serine except an amino acid in the middle means aspergine. You can have proline, glycine, isoleucine or any other amino acid, sorry not proline but except proline any other amino acid like uh, it could be glycine, it could be leucine, it could be isoleucine and so on and then followed by serine. This would be a condition where in this sequence this aspergine molecule can be glycosylated. So if this aspergine molecule here is not followed by, uh, by, by, by a serine except the one in the middle, then this is not going to get glycosylated. And the other condition is that the second amino acid, uh, sorry first, second, third, the third amino acid needs to be threonine. So only those aspergines which are followed by an amino acid, any other amino acid except proline and then serine or threonine. So the first amino acid needs to be aspergine, the amino acid that has to be glycosylated. That is going to be an aspergine followed by any, other, any amino acid except proline and then followed by serine or threonine. So if this is the condition, if these two conditions are met, that the aspergine is being followed by any amino acid other than proline and then followed by serine, then this aspergine molecule can get glycosylated. If not, then this aspergine would uh, not be uh, glycosylated and the polypeptide chain will keep on growing into the uh, ER lumen without glycosylation. So uh, one important thing is that these two sequences aspergine followed by serine and aspergine x threonine so these two conditions or these two sequences they occur much less frequently in the glycoproteins one would think that these should be uh, the number of uh, these sequences should be higher in those proteins which need to be get gly glycosylated but this is not the case and the reason why this is not the case is to um, the, the, the reason is the selective pressure against these sequences during protein evolution. So when proteins were getting evolved, then uh, uh, I mean basically the, the, uh, if, if you have too many of these sequences in a protein that you have every, I don't know, fifth amino acid where you have this 
or every tenth amino acid is aspartame, and then this is also being followed by the same sequence here in the protein or into the polypeptide chain, then this would protein would get heavily glycosylated. So there would be too many oligosaccharide molecules being associated with this polypeptide chain, and that is going to interfere with the uh, with with the proper folding of that particular protein. So uh, when proteins need to be glycosylated, they are glycosylated inside the ER. So definitely th these are not the proteins which are living inside the cytoplasm of the cell because there's no mechanism for the glycosylation of the proteins inside the cytoplasm. So the proteins first need to be translocated into the ER so that they can be uh, they can be glycosylated by the oligosaccharyl, oligosaccharyl transferase. So the proteins which live inside the cytoplasm, they're not um, uh, glycosylated. So if they need to be glycosylated, they would later be transported into the ER in order to get uh, glycosylated. Uh, otherwise, if, they are no, uh, if, the, if no glycosylation is needed, the protein can stay inside the cytoplasm. So um, for the proteins which are uh, being synthesized on the ER, the polypeptide chain is going to grow into the lumen of the ER and simultaneously during the translational process, this is uh, going to get glycosylated. So when these proteins are being glycosylated, if you have too many aspergine molecules and these molecules have this sequence, aspergine X serine or aspergine X threonine, then there would be too much of glycosylation on this protein molecule and if this happens then um, too much of this glycosylation is going to interfere with the proper folding of that protein and if that protein is not properly folded then uh, definitely this is uh, not going to perform its function properly so this is the reason that in those proteins which need to be glycosylated the number of these sequences is kept lower so that glycosylation takes place where it is needed uh, and it's not just random or too much glycosylation and we we call this process n uh, glycosylations that these proteins are n glycolated and the reason is that uh, here you see that this uh, is the aspergine molecule and this is the amino end of the aspergine mo molecule and this has got this side chain so generally uh, the, the, the oligosaccharide molecules are associated with the, with the side chains uh, towards the amino end of the, of, the, of the aspergine molecule. That's why we call it N-glycosylation. And this is the, uh, uh, this is the, the, the carboxylic end, this is the amino end, and this is the carboxylic end of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of this amino acid. And this is being followed by any amino acid but not proline and then followed by serine or threonine so if this condition is met this aspergine is going to get glycosylated but if this glycos if this aspergine molecule was followed by proline even if it contains serine or threonine at third position this aspergine is not going to get glycosylated so it has to have um, an amino acid at second position other than proline. It must not be a pro proline. So if there's proline here, this aspergine is not going to get glycosylated. And the other condition is, the second condition is the presence of a serine or three, threonine or molecules. So basically these are, there are two conditions for the glycosylation of the aspergine molecules that this aspergine molecules has to be followed by any amino acid other than proline which should again be followed by serine or threonine so if that's the sequence then this aspergine is going to get glycosylated and generally these uh, oligosaccharide molecules they consist of uh, glucose mannose and n glucosamine so that's the basic uh, structure and here you see that this is there's a gray box around some um, some some molecules uh, some carbohydrate molecules so this constitutes the core region of this oligosaccharide 
And what does core region mean? We know that proteins, after being glycosylated in the ER, they would be transported to the Golgi apparatus. And when they're transported, when they're transported, when they're transported to the to the Golgi apparatus, then these branches uh, of these oligosaccharide molecules they are trimmed off. So most of the times, most of the proteins, in, in most of the proteins, only the core region would survive the extensive trimming process that takes place inside the Golgi apparatus. So these uh, amino acids, these carbohydrate molecules, sorry, these carbohydrate molecules, they would be deleted or removed inside the Golgi apparatus. And in most of the proteins, this region would survive the trimming process. It's not like an exceptional, uh, it's, it's, it's not like, uh, it is definitely going to happen like this, that this is only the core region that survives the streaming process. It depends upon the protein that was glycosylated. Um, some of the other carbohydrate molecules can also be left on this, uh, on this oligosaccharide molecule. But generally the core region uh, more or less uh, is, is, is much more resilient and uh, it, it can survive the trimming process. But this can still be associated with other molecules as well during the trimming process. So if this, uh, if this is a glycoprotein, a larger, a larger gly glycoprotein, then lots of, um, uh, lots of aspergine molecules would be glycosylated and they could even have uh, larger a bunch of, um, of, of oligosaccharide molecules attached onto them. So uh, I think this is sufficient for today. This was just an example. This is just an example to, to talk about the post-translational modifications. Just to, I, I, I would quickly uh, revise it once again. Uh, so we have two types of modifications. Um, co-translational uh, modifications and post-translational modifications. And here we are talking about the glycosylation process. So in co-translational tra uh, tra uh, co translational translocation, oligosaccharide transferase would transfer this oligosaccharide molecule which is anchored onto a dolicol molecule. Uh, this, would, this molecule would be transferred onto the uh, growing polypeptide chain. Uh, but uh, the, there would be a condition uh, that uh, this uh, Aspergine must be followed by an amino acid which is not proline, and then this pro this this amino acid, the second amino acid, must be followed by serine or threonine. Then this aspergine molecule the molecule is going to get glycosylated, and uh, these dolicol molecules are involved in both co-translational uh, glycosylation process as well as post-translational glycosylation process that takes place inside the ER. I think that's sufficient for today. Thank you very much.